120 jury charge. Members of the jury, you have now heard all the evidence in this case. You have also listened to the attorneys on each side tell you what they believe the evidence has shown. It is now your duty to decide the facts in this case and reach a decision. I will now tell you the law which you must follow in reaching your decision. Although you may not like the law as I tell it to you or think it should be different, you are bound under oath to follow it. During your deliberations, you should consider everything that I tell you and not single out only one part of it. Your duty as jurors in this case is to try only the issues presented by the allegations in the indictment. The defendant is not on trial for any act or conduct not alleged in the indictment. The indictment will be before you in the jury room. It is in no way to be considered by you as evidence in the case. It is simply a statement of the charges with which the defendant is accused and it creates no presumption nor unfavorable inference against the defendant. A plea of not guilty has been entered and the law presumes the defendant is innocent. The defendant begins the trial with a clean slate and with no evidence against him. The law permits nothing but legal evidence presented before the jury to be considered in support of any charge against the accused. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit the defendant unless the jurors are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in the case. At the beginning of the trial, the attorneys for both sides told you what they believed the evidence would show. At the end, they told you what they believed the evidence had in fact shown. Their comments to you are not evidence and you are free to agree or disagree with the attorneys. It is not required that the government prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. The test in a case of this sort is one of reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense. That is the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act. The jury should remember that a defendant is never to be convicted on mere suspicion or conjecture. The burden of proof upon the government never shifts unless the government proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed each element of the offense with which he is charged, you must find him not guilty. Flight or concealment by a person after a crime has been committed or after he has been accused of a crime may be motivated by a variety of factors which are fully consistent with innocence. It does not create a presumption of guilt, nor does the flight or concealment reflect feelings of guilt. You should consider and weigh evidence of flight by the defendant in connection with all the other evidence in the case and give it such weight as you feel it is fairly entitled to receive. In order to prove the defendant is guilty of the crime of bank robbery as charged in count three 
of the indictment, the government must prove the following. Number one, that the defendant took from the person or presence of an employee of the Chase Bank in Seattle, Washington, money or a thing of value that belonged to or was in possession of said bank. Number two, that the taking of said property was accomplished by force or violence or by means of intimidation. Number three, that the deposits of said bank were insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Number four, that the act was done knowingly. Number five, that the crime took place on April 1 of this year in the state of Washington. You may also convict this defendant if you find that some other person committed the elements I have described to you and you also find that this defendant aided and abetted that person. A person may not be convicted for both the crime of bank robbery and the crime of possession of stolen bank currency. You must first consider whether or not the defendant robbed the Chase Bank in this city and on that date. If you find that the government has not proved the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must consider whether or not this defendant possessed stolen bank currency as charged in the indictment. Again, I remind you that a person may not be convicted of both crimes. The crime charged in this case is a very serious crime, which requires proof of specific intent before the defendant can be convicted. Specific intent, as the term implies, means more than the general intent to commit the act. To establish intent, the government must prove that the defendant knowingly did an act which the law forbids, intending to violate the law. The mere presence at the scene of a crime and knowledge that a crime is being committed is not sufficient to convict one of aiding and abetting unless there is proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the person charged with it did something to forward the crime. In other words, the government must prove that the defendant accused of this crime was an active participant and not merely a spectator. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to examine your own views and change your opinion if you are convinced it is in error, but do not surrender your honest convictions as to the weight or effect of evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the purpose of returning a verdict. You will note from the oath about to be taken by the clerks that they, as well, are forbidden to communicate in any way or manner with any member of the jury on any subject touching the merits of the case.